It's the week of May 24th, and this is the Wild at Heart Podcast. I'm Alan Arnold, and with me in the studio today is Sam Eldridge. Hey, Sam. Hey, Alan. You sound great. (laughs) This actually is pretty good for me right now. If you guys listening missed last week's podcast with John, Sam, and myself, I thought at the time I was just hoarse from doing too many speaking events. Found out since then I have a nodule on my vocal cords from speaking too much and we'll be having a procedure June 9th to get that fixed. So would love your guys' prayers on that. It doesn't hurt in the meantime. I just am ready to have my full strength voice back. Is this like that scene from City Slickers where we start calling things procedures and they're actually <laughs> surgeries? Yeah, well, it is kind of a surgery. I think they're cutting you open. It, they're, well, they're going through my throat. Um, I'm terrified. To cut. I'm so sorry. A nodule out. But the reason that, Sam, you're here today is pretty exciting. We are going to focus this week and next on two podcasts that are originally and Sons podcast. And before we talk about what this week's is, I would love for you to just tell everybody what's new at Ann Sons right now, how they can support Ann Sons. Yeah, so there's a, a small contingent of you that are cross listeners, but for the majority of you that don't know, Ann Sons is the, the Wild at Heart sort of uh, department thrust towards young men. It, the tagline is initiation in the young man's soul. And uh, we've actually just launched over on Patreon which is a platform that lets creators offer what they're doing with different tiers and different um, bonuses and, and these kinds of things that we haven't actually been able to offer before. So it's for folks who want to support, get the print magazine, join our live streams, get access to some of this swag that we create only for the people that have been around for a really long time. So it's been really exciting to have this tight knit community over there with people who are throwing their hats into the mission of Ansons. And it's really fresh and new and live streaming. (laughs) (laughs) So if they want to find out more. Yeah, I would head over to Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Ansons. Come check us out. Awesome. Okay, now tell us about this week's Ansom podcast. It's a really unique interview. And what you'll see is Ansons really isn't just for the target audience that it's built for. It's for everyone who's listening right now. Yeah, I love getting to do interviews with people from all walks of life. That's something we try to do for Ansons is interview older men who are in that sage life stage and they can offer things or interview guys who just have a wild story. In this case, we got to interview a mother, a woman, an artist who wrote into us and shared a little bit about her story of suffering and lament. And it was in response to an episode that Blaine and I had done where we talked about needing to be okay with being angry with God and invite God into those areas where we do experience unmet desires or disappointment with him. And long story short, Sarah ended up writing in, has a uh, work of music that accompanied her story. And so I reached out to her to knit together probably one of my favorite interviews we've done. We have a conversation on suffering interspersed with little snippets of an album that she wrote to go with her story. And then at the end, her album is available online. The link is in the episode, Um, but she wanted that to be available for free for anybody that enjoyed it. Right. And we'll make that available to all the listeners today as well. It's a beautiful podcast, the songs, the story. So here we go with the Ansons podcast. There are chapters to our stories We may never understand And sometimes even strong hearts they break Hey guys, welcome back to the Incense Podcast. I'm Sam. And I'm Blaine. You may have noticed that the intro music is different today. That is on purpose. Because today, Blaine and I sat down with Sarah Bianchi to talk about suffering. Sarah is a musician, and she wrote an album on lament after experiencing several losses and griefs with her family that we are going to do a little bit of a different episode this week by interspersing 
small portions of that album into the conversation. At the end of the episode, we'll air uh, one of the songs in its entirety. And if you'd like to be able to hear the whole album or download it, Sarah has requested that it be available for anyone who wants access to it. So you can find it online at ansonsmagazine.com backslash Sarah Bianchi. Sarah, thank you for saying yes to an email from a stranger to come on and talk about a really easy topic. (laughs) You're welcome. You're welcome. I'm glad to be here. Well, Sarah, you first came onto my radar a couple of years ago. Blaine and I did an episode on um, lament, actually, on the like just wrestling through bringing our best to God all of the time and feeling like we couldn't um, really grieve or or do that with Him. And that was mm-hmm. back in I think 2018, and it was then that. Your husband, husband AJ, wrote me a letter. You had written an album and sent it to me, um, sent it to us. Mm-hmm. And so for uh, folks, as you're listening, that's the music that's going to be interspersing this episode um, as we dive into a topic that I think we all are painfully familiar with and yet try to keep at a distance. So Sarah, is there anything that you'd like the listeners to know about the album and about the music they're going to be hearing. Yeah, this these songs are actually really uh, raw to my heart. I was um, deep in a place of grief myself and just could barely have a conversation without tearing up and crying. And so I felt like I just need to sit down and pull up my guitar and see what surfaces. So I set up a mic and these are just a... Um, room recording of stream of conscious prayers that came out. And it was a really interesting thing to go and listen back to them because I could hear this movement of these raw things that I would not probably say out loud to somebody about how I felt about God. My grief, my desire, um, just this this come in and rescue and, and take this away. I want to be done with this. But now being able to go back and listen to it, it felt to me like something that was more honest than I would have even spoken aloud. Is there any courage left among the brave? Can you make the moon and the stars alive? Bring it in, bring it in, bring it in to this long day. Bring it in, bring it in, bring it in to this long day. I really wanted to begin this conversation. Not this isn't uh, to try and jump into just let's find the deepest nerve, what's the most exposed wound, and jump there. Um, but I had I had had a lot of experiences recently where when things go wrong on a really small scale, like the kids had a bad morning, we've got a two-year-old and a four-year-old currently, and they are two and four, which means some mornings are pretty chaotic. And I've got an old minivan with a busted taillight and the engine light on basically all the time. And I had been experiencing people straight up telling me that it was my fault. That like when things went wrong, when things went poorly, it was because of some sin maybe in my life, because I didn't pray enough, um, that really those things were like symptoms that I was doing something wrong. And I found myself like having really a visceral reaction to it. And I started watching that it it goes all the way up the scale. Um, even to having a conversation with some friends recently who are walking through a journey of cancer and people telling him on a regular basis, oh, well, you have cancer because of something you did. Like, this is your fault, as though those words are somehow helpful, needed, or correct. So that's the doorway that I'm opening. Sarah, Blaine, have you experienced this uh, I don't know, 
oddity phenomenon interaction with people where something goes wrong and and those around you not only do they not bring compassion but they sort of bring a sword and a finger nope oh that's our show guys oh good (laughs) (laughs) oh good that's just me then Uh, well uh, my only friend is jesus so (laughs) of course easy thing for you to talk about is yes Of course, the answer is, we're going to slide all the way down the rabbit hole very quickly in this conversation because the points are connected. Uh, But the, yes, the feeling that something is uh, fundamentally wrong. And I think also my wife was recently lamenting at the problem solving disposition that people bring to stories of pain Mm. as a default. Not that it's wrong to want to like solve, to resolve the issue, Mm. but it seems to show a presupposition Mm -hmm. that it's wrong (laughs) right? uh, or that you're doing something wrong. And unfortunately, most of the time things feel wrong in the season that we're in on the earth and in the young family years and in the, uh, and in a life in, I think, like any kind of normal community. Hmm. But the, I would say, where I experience what you're asking about is in the leap to diagnose an issue um, where, you know, I'll go, man, I am really, uh, let's say, frustrated with God right now. And People take out the unbelief radar and start wanding me. <laughs> right? It's like, oh, yeah, well, okay, I don't know. <laughs> well, well, what's the problem? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think that there is, there is a reactivity in people and in me, full disclosure, uh, to a description of pain that I feel like uh, blaming or solving or distancing is almost part of a defense mechanism to try to get away from something that's so uncomfortable. Yeah. For me, it feels like just this baseline human nature of we want to control everything. So even in our pain, if we can figure out a way to fix it, if we can figure out what's the root of the problem, and then we make this better, Mm -hmm. it's still us playing God. We cannot be open-handed in any sort of mystery that there can be pain without a fix. And so we immediately just go to slap on some sort of um, diagnosis to here's the reason why and here's how you fix it. Mm-hmm. And I think it's just staying it's staying on the shallow. Um, it's staying in the shallow water, right? Because then it's still us keeping a grip on things. It's still us controlling our own pain and um i don't know that's that seems to be the the story right. of human human nature since yep. the beginning of time right we just want to play god can you just take it all away can you just thinking of a dear friend and they listen to the podcast so i'm not going to identify them um i'm gonna see if i can guess who i'm they gonna are. change their gender and their name and their age i'm still gonna guess but when things go wrong they're like the russian to solve it thing like they're not the kind of person where you sit and you explain like oh it's been a really difficult situation in work lately and they say i'm sorry that sounds hard they say, oh, well, how could you? They jumped right to like the fixing piece because there is that discomfort. Um, and I, 
uh, it's actually disorienting. Is this person literally anyone's mom? <laughs> <laughs> it is mom. It actually yeah, it yeah, is yeah, it is yeah, a mom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I I do it too. Uh, I've got this been reading Henry Nowen's The Way of the Heart, um, and he's got a great quote in there as he encourages us towards solitude that is very much to this point. So it reads, let us not underestimate how hard it is to be compassionate. Compassion is hard because it requires the inner disposition to go with others to the place where they are weak, vulnerable, lonely, and broken. But this is not our spontaneous response to suffering. What we desire most is to do away with suffering by fleeing from it or finding a quick cure for it. Yeah, guilty. Guilty, and I think we've all experienced the, yeah. the, what gets missed with that reaction, right? When, you, mm. when there's, I mean, I'm talking about small-scale things like, something, like yeah. something being difficult at work or kids having a rough morning or the car engine light being on and feeling unseen and unmet in that place. And that's a one. That's a, that's a one on the scale of where suffering goes to. That certainly piles up. Like those, those ones can become 100 because there's a, more, probably more than 100 of them. Yeah. But I've seen that, like if I can push somebody through the, you need to be okay, like sitting in this with me, it then slides into what I've experienced as the, uh, it's not really a big deal conversation. A couple of years ago, our daughter, Finley, woke herself up in the night with just blood at her neck. Like she had, was covered in head-to-toe rash and was so itchy in her sleep that she was scratching, scratching, scratching and didn't wake herself up until she'd clawed open. And so we wake up to you know, screaming toddler, blood all over her neck. I mean, it wasn't... And see, there it is, actually. There's my... It's not a big deal. And I remember a friend sort of did both. Like a friend asked me like if I needed to confess something and that that was why she was experiencing this. Um, and something in me felt like just this tearing with that friendship. Not that, not that this friend doesn't love me, not that there isn't a place for that question, um, but probably not hot on the heels of the experience. And then the minimizing, then the, well, it, this is just a head to toe rash. Um, we're just grateful that we have a daughter or, or, or something along those lines. There's actually one of our staff here at, at Wild at Heart that one of their kids was having a tough time and it was manifesting in some like bodily reactions and some stress in them. And we were asking more about the situation and they're like, well, you know, one of the seniors in their school actually just took their own life, um, but he didn't really know them. So I don't really think that's the category. And something in me just like hit, the, hit a, a wall. Because two years ago here in Colorado Springs, when a student in a school commits suicide, the whole school shuts down. Like, doesn't matter if you know this person, but there was a appropriate reaction to something traumatic like that. And then fast forward to 2020, 2021, where we're just in a state of stress and trauma. and a suicide could happen in a student population. And it was like an aside, like school kept on rolling and it wasn't even a factor for why this, another student might be doing poorly. So this, this next, like the minimizing piece just gets in and I don't know how to escape from it personally. I feel like we're not practiced in sitting with pain and, and I don't know, I don't know enough of, of the global sphere of how people grieve to know if this is just an American thing or not. Um, and this is why I think lament is so important because the church has, has an opportunity here to, to help believers practice being in pain and not just rushing past it. Right. So when we minimize it, it's because we basically, other people are kind of like, I'm feeling uncomfortable that you're still sad about your dog dying or, or whatever. And, and that was Tuesday and now it's Friday. Let's, let's just like keep moving on um, because everyone else has it worse, right? And all it does is create cultures now of, of everybody shamed about their pain, stuffing it down, not addressing it. And um, as humans, we are empathetic 
feeling people. Like that's not how we were created to be. And so when we don't have language to be able to give words to our pain and what we're feeling, and then we feel like there's this timeline of, okay, that's enough now. It's no longer appropriate to be feeling like this. I just feel like we, we've completely diminished our ability to process as human beings what it is to be in pain. And then we don't have any muscles for being in chronic pain, which is what I feel like mm. we're all in right now. Like mm. COVID became this season now of everybody's in pain at the same time. And we don't know when this is ending. And um, we don't have language for this. So it's kind of like, how are you doing? Are you still not doing good? Well, no, none of us are really doing great because this is still going on. And there's so much suffering and pain inside and nobody knows how to talk about it because we've just been diminishing it for so long. Um, mm. A few years ago, my son was diagnosed with a chronic illness and so many people said the wrong things. And it was a lot of, um, well, at least it's not this, at least it's not that, at least your other kids are healthy, you know, and I I was so angry. I just wanted to hit every person who said that to me. And I started just not talking to people mm -hmm. because their desire out of love to help take away my pain just completely minimized it and didn't allow me to say, this is really sad and it completely sucks. And I want to do anything in my power to change it. Can you just sit here with me and feel those things with me and not try to solve this? So absolutely, I feel like the motivation behind the minimizing is to try to relieve us of our pain um, because we're none of us are comfortable with it. But you, in doing so, you just cut off all that language. And like you said, it doesn't make it go away better. It doesn't fix it. It doesn't make it lighten. We carry it around silently and that makes it worse. in those moments, like in the thick of it, not not afterwards, not now with a little bit of mm -hmm. distance from certain things, but in the middle, hot on the heels of suffering and like the, what feels like the epicenter, what do you wish either people did or what worked for that space? The people who showed up and asked me how I was doing and weren't looking for me to say, I'm doing okay. That was really important to me. And I could tell the people who wanted the right answer and the people who wanted the real answer. And there were few who wanted the real answer because it was hard, um, especially those that are close to you. I think to um, family and, and the dearest friends, they also feel pain when you feel pain, right? You, you notice this with your kids. Your kids fall down. You just want to fix it and take away the pain. And what I've noticed in that is the gift of presence of people being with you and they can't take it away. There is nothing that we can do to fix my son. I can't fix him. So you don't, don't give me any answers. Don't give me any logic. There's nothing that you could tell me that would make me feel okay. But the gift of presence is hugely underrated. We need to show up for people and just be with them. Because if you notice, this is what Jesus asked for the night before his crucifixion. He wanted his friends just with him. 
And he said, please just don't fall asleep while I go and pray. Right. He, he knew they had no answer. There's no, um, again, some of our pain goes so beyond words that it's like, I just need you present and I need you here. Cause I'm scared being alone. Mm. So that was huge is people who were able to be with me in my pain, knowing I, that I wasn't okay and they couldn't fix it, but they were there. That was huge. Mm. The other thing for me was ironically, or maybe not because people were not helpful, getting alone. There were these places that had used to be a, a source of comfort, church, and um, like I said, being around um, loved ones and things like that, where it kind of made it worse because of the things that we're saying, you know, when, when you go to church and everyone's just praising and you're in a very hard, raw spot, that can make you feel really lonely. And God in his goodness provided for me this space. We have this monastery that's very close to us and it's about 10 minutes away and it has all these trails and beautiful nature reserves. And um, I started going there and just sitting and, and, and weeping. And it was the safe space where I could cry. You know, if I did it in church, I feel like people would be asking, you know, are you okay? Can I fix this? Right. Can I um, <laughs> get involved in in whatever is happening with you? And um, I would go and I'd walk and I would cry. And um, that was another huge, huge relief for me to be able to feel my pain and just express it and and let it out. And not fix it, not solve it, not rush it past where, you know, what we should be past this by now. So is this a literal monastery or a metaphorical yeah. monastery? No, it's literal. It is a monastery. Wow. Um, I know my husband kept joking. He's like, I feel like you're just going to move there now. <laughs> because um, I loved, I loved it. It's beautiful. And there are, there's some um, Benedictine sisters who live there, but it's open to the public where you can come and um, they do retreats and there's benches everywhere on these trails. So you go for these long hikes and then you, there's a bench and you just mm. sit and or, or it's so quiet there. And I, I realized that more than anything, like my deep internal had so many questions and so much um, just hard things that the quiet was a balm to me. So good. That is good. I'm aware that my default is also to pull back or dissociate. So when we recorded that podcast in 2018, I don't even know if we were in the part of that year yet where I had lost my friend suddenly. and. The interesting thing was most people, that door was closed and I was working hard to kind of build walls around that spot. There are some people whose presence was soothing, who were themselves very familiar with suffering, very familiar with that territory of mystery. And I don't know if I liked them anymore because I was, you know, in that, I was just aware in that season also grappling with something that I didn't really want to engage, which was, it is easier to a certain extent if it's my fault, because then suffering is not this mysterious future of the universe that forces us to go, Jesus, what is with this moment on the earth? What is the deal? And, but once I moved through my fault or not a big deal or whatever else it was into like, here's a real non-fixable problem. The solitude element is that required some pretty significant time actually venturing into the territory of, I love um, Nicholas Wolterstorff, Lament for a Son. He has this line that I went, yes, that's what it is. And he said, well, I've learned to find you in the darkness, not in the shafts of light that remain, but in the darkness itself, because I only ever found you in the light before. And mm. this, this experience of going, I could try to emphasize the positive dimensions of this experience. And you see families do this in tragedy. Isn't it amazing that we still have each other? Isn't it amazing that we're being drawn closer through this? And it's like, 
Is that as amazing as the departure of a person from this earth in this violent rift? Are those commensurate? But there's an impulse to try to find the light versus finding God in the darkness, finding God in the territory that Mm. suffering is a dimension of our life with God. It's a dimension of our union with Christ. And I don't want to go there. So in the what works thing, for me, what I need is time and space to slowly work my way into that territory because I will not go in quickly. Mm. And I think, Mm -hmm. you know, people who are more familiar with suffering, they, I watch that. It's like people who are really great at going into cold water where they just kind of are able Mm -hmm. at this point in their story to go in and to not resist and to go in with confidence that they're not going to be in goal. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's just obvious. I'm like, I'm more that way than I was a decade ago. Mm. I am much less that way than some of the older couples and families that we've seen go through a lifetime of life with God yeah. and suffer major losses. And so when they're inside, they feel so different mm. in their, in the lack of anger and dread associated with engaging pain. Yeah. But I think that's also because they've probably worked through something already. That, yeah, totally. Right? So we can look at somebody like that and go, gosh, I just wish I had their like totally Zen (laughs) approach to (laughs) anything tragic, right? Or they just roll with it. But like you're saying, the hard part is you don't grow those muscles till you go through it. So most of us are very well versed of who is God in the light, right? That's where all of our worship and praise comes from. Well, when you sit in the dark for a while, nobody wants to go from the light to the dark. I mean, that is so frightening. But for the people who've been in the dark for a while, when they come back in to the light and are drawn back, they just know, I'm not going to get swallowed up. I know there's something there and we're going to be okay. Yeah. seasons of grief a friend I was just walking with the other day said the phrase of just that grief is non-linear and I think I feel that this that we almost want it to be like an earthquake and then the further away you get from the epicenter the the more and more well and whole you get and to some extent that's true but to many others it's not it's like there were many earthquakes and I'll be going along one day and then just I'll read a story or I'll I'll hear about a friend's experience of loss or suffering and it, it's as though I am back there mm-hmm. and it's been helpful for me doing a little bit of study in the direction of the, that I'm going um, I think of Dan Allender um, teaching us about memory and trauma um, and we've touched on this before but that what the the little bit of science they've been able to do on trauma in the mind they've been able to see that we do go as back as 90% to the original experience when we remember, when, when something else causes us to sit with it. And so when that nonlinear grief resurfaces and you're like, oh, I'm having a really good year. And then all of a sudden there was just a Tuesday and I'm back in the weight of everything to have mercy for that space of you very much are. You're not actually stirring it up and trying to get something, trying to get attention out of it, trying to get sympathy out of it. Like you're back in that original moment of tearing and of loss and to have mercy for those around us who experience that 
and have mercy for ourselves in those moments of like, I do not expect much productivity from you or yourself that afternoon. Like do the walk, go for the drive. There have been many mm-hmm. a work day where I've just closed the laptop and driven around for the last hour of the day through Garden of the Gods here, sobbing over the loss of other griefs from other friends that trigger my own and take me back into those places mm-hmm. and just to go, I know if I don't, if I don't enter into them, I'm not actually going to be able to heal them and move forward with everything that that means. So there's a lot there, but a piece for me in here, Jesus promises us suffering. Just react to me saying that, like, is that something that you believe, agree with? Is that something that gets talked about? Like, what do you do with me saying that when suffering happens as followers of Jesus, you haven't done something wrong and it's actually something that Jesus anticipated for you? I fully believe we don't do something wrong. I, and maybe it's me looking at my perfect boy going, there's no way, you know, This is a product of just this broken world. I have for sure had the conversation though with God of what in the world is the point? What is the point? What is the point of suffering? Why? Blaine had touched on this. Um, No matter what deep internal growth or whatever is coming from this, I don't want it. I just, I want, I want him whole. But I do know, I feel something in my, in my deep soul. So this is probably um, the spirit in me nudging me forward that you will understand at some point, right? It's sort of this, how we can't explain to our two-year-old of why they need to eat their vegetables. You know, it's, this is pure torture. And you're saying I, your, your brain, your mind is just cannot comprehend this. So um It's been a challenge for me personally to just live in this space of mystery and paradox, and I can't understand all of it. And that is where I've landed, that suffering is going to be something in this world. We we know this. We see this everywhere. Unfortunately, I think there are some gospels out there that show us if you do all the right things, then God's going to bless you with all the best things. And I think it's just false there's a shallowness to God then that he's like this wizard or genie that I don't really want to believe in. This God who has held me steady despite anxiety and fear and the harshest questions I could throw at him. This God who's basically saying, I can't explain it to you, but I will stay with you. And something in me feels like that's enough. That feels to me like a a steadier answer than any words that would make me feel like this is okay. Well, well navigated, because this is a question that every philosophy class starting in freshman year of high school is thrown. Oh, and the thing with the philosophers is that they're full of shit. And (laughs) the way that you ask that question is instructive. Mm -hmm. And I want our listeners to imitate it because. It's so good to go, Jesus says that you'll have suffering. What do you feel hearing that? And I think the interesting thing is that there is a progression Mm. because knowing that fact is not a shortcut. Mm. And it's not the next thing to try to fix it, right? Because I've also heard that in terms of the, therefore, you're okay. Right. It's like an eject lever. Exactly. And you're just... Well, Jesus promises suffering and go, if you know that, it doesn't get you through the Mm. listening phase. It doesn't get you through the lament phase. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, we asked a couple for prayer at a time where I was pretty devastated. And as I began sharing, right in the middle, they were so tuned into me and into what was going on that she starts crying. And then the husband just threw himself on the floor to, like, lament with me and that let me start crying. And and these are people who know that Jesus promises suffering, but the fact doesn't get you around the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like what you said, 
to around, this is something that opens to us over time because it can be really pat. And if you read people's explanations of the fact, they're usually not very good (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) because it's a problem that humanity is eager to solve so that we'll trust Jesus, but it's Mm -hmm. a problem that can only be resolved in Jesus. So I think the other thing is to go, hey, not being pat, not trying to get out of it. Here is something that right now in my real-time story of engaging that. Our rescue is that we can attach to God and we, and we become in Christ. And then we're like confronted, I think, with the way that Jesus chose to save the world rather than mm-hmm. just burning it down, like sometimes I would prefer that mm-hmm. he would. Mm-hmm. The fact that Jesus chose to save it can't be overstated. We were doing a forgiveness exercise with some friends recently, helping them respond to human evil and be like, what do you do with the fact that that dad is still such an asshole? And my desire to be like, Jesus, do something. And Jesus is offered being like, I will cover it. I will, out of myself, cancel the effects of that person, that family. I will bring a restoration. I will give directly to them what I could have given indirectly through the Father. But I will not destroy, like, the basic parts of this world to rescue it, to save it. Those two don't ride together. I've been this year struck by the, like, whoa, we don't suffer apart from Jesus. We suffer in Christ. And... Jesus doesn't assign us sufferings to then go do for our development. Like when we find ourselves swept up into the story of Jesus's redemption of the world, it's this thing that he achieved by suffering. We're like suffering is this part of it. And that's where my understanding stops right now is like, and suffering mm-hmm. is a part of it. Philosophers can pull out some, some handy self-referential, like, and the reason why is this blah, 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 blah ontology. And be like, I mean, that might, work in your chest game, but it doesn't apply to the world where I live. You know, what I'm learning now is, oh my gosh, being united with Christ in suffering is a choice and a skill because I'm fully capable of suffering in rage at God all the way through. Mm -hmm. And then the pain stops and I keep living. Something triggers it later. And I realize I went through that entire thing in like rage mode at God. The big ones and the death have been a little easier. You know, like our, you know, 20 weeks along miscarriage was devastating. And there was a purity to it that my wife's chronic pain, I don't respond to in the same way. My wife's chronic pain makes me so mad. Mm -hmm. And that's a territory where suffering with her, with God, is very difficult because I want the pain to stop. And, and it's not right now. And so my response is anger, not unite with Christ. Yeah, there's a lot in there that we'll, that we'll keep teasing out. But those, you know, we call them big T traumas versus small T traumas, like the deaths that, that we've experienced or the losses we've experienced. Um, they are a cutting. Like there is a abrupt edge where there's just, that's the end of that story. And you, you're almost shell shocked as the way that you're going to be encountering your sh- your suffering, your grief. Like there's just this bell ring. Whereas the lower case T trauma is like I imagine like a paper that's just riddled with holes, and like that's now your book, and you're going to be encountering like you're missing a word here, you're missing a word here, you're missing a whole sentence here, and it's so pervasive, but it's so low grade that you actually aren't able to interact with it in the painful and different way that a full-on torn out page would be. But yes, the lower case, low grade losses and traumas that we experience, my gosh, I've been learning to have more and more mercy for those as we, and as I experience the fruit of living with them and not dealing with them, just Mm. carrying them all. I think for me, when I hear about this verse, John sixteen thirty three, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, 
but take heart, I have overcome the world. This is a verse that people point to and they say Jesus has promised us suffering. There's a part of me that looks at it like I want to antidote the normal flow that I experience when I experience brokenness. And I want to avoid the, the philosophy, God is either not all powerful or not all good, bull crap. And that's not what this conversation is about. And to go, okay, it, what if it is not your fault? And what if it is a big deal? And just because everyone else is experiencing pain, that doesn't minimize yours, but that is a vehicle through which we can actually draw closer to others and closer to God. I have been really enjoying getting to email a lot of our listeners who are joining us for the February experiments, which is going on while we are recording this podcast. But I've been blown away by it feels like 80% of the emails, if not more, have some significant story of loss that's recent. I mean, two stories I just grabbed almost read identically of experiencing COVID, losing work, having a child, and losing a best friend of 26 years or someone who's like a sister. Like suicides, deaths, job losses, divorces miscarriages, they categorize almost all of the emails and stories that I hear these days. And rather than that minimizing my own, I hear this promise from Jesus of, no, this, is, this is the setting. This is the story. Be aware of it and actually let it increase your empathy and compassion for others. Take heart <laughs> And also take care of your own heart as you begin to navigate these things. I love um, the story of the magician's nephew of the C.S. Lewis Narnia series. I don't know why particularly. I, I think it's just because of this one piece. So for those of you not aware of that story, um, this happens towards the end of the, the book where Aslan has just created Narnia and things are growing out of the ground um, they throw, the, they lose the, like the bar from the lamppost and it grows a lamppost tree. And Diggory, the male protagonist, has a sick mother and she's chronically ill and dying. And he has been hearing rumors of the place where the tree of life or the fountain of youth exists. And so he assumes that he's got there. So here is the exchange between Diggory and Aslan. Diggory says, but please, please, won't you? Can't you give me something that will cure mother? Then the narrator. Up until then, he had been looking at the great lion's feet and the huge claws on them. Now, in his despair, he looked up at its face. What he saw surprised him as much as anything in his whole life. For the tawny face was bent down near his own. And wonder of wonders, great shining tears stood in the lion's eyes. They were such big, bright tears compared with Diggory's own that for a moment he felt as if the lion must really be sorrier about his mother than he was himself. My son, my son, said Aslan. I know, grief is great. <clears throat> grief is great. Only you and I in this land know that yet. Let us be good to one another. I honestly, like, I can't hear it and can't read it without yeah. tears. Um, yeah. And that's a piece for me as well of this, Blaine, as you were talking, like the, the trajectory is towards uniting because it draws me out of isolation and draws my story into being seen and known. Sam, that passage, I actually had written down verbatim in my journal. Mm shortly after my son's diagnosis. And that was one of the passages that I felt broke me open. That again, is this mystery that I can't put into words, but that I just knew that God was weeping with me. And it sounds really trite. And it sounds like something we say to each other to just like slap this on a t-shirt. God's weeping with, with you. But it means everything to know that we are truly not alone in our suffering. And if you have a God 
who is all powerful and all good and chooses to step into suffering, this human suffering that we deal with every day. I mean, that must mean everything. We are not alone, not alone. We are not alone in the darkness. We are not alone, not alone. We are not alone in the darkness. Oh. Oh. <sighs>